in God's word he has given how beautiful a heaven must be how beautiful a heaven must be must be sweet home of the happy and Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful a heaven must be, must be. I'm longing to go to fair heaven to be with a happy and To spend the long ages in singing how beautiful a heaven must be. The angels so sweetly are singing up there by the beautiful sea. from their gold harps are ringing how beautiful heaven must be 
shall sail safely though the waves dash high Broken friends. 
loved David Phelps, and who doesn't? I mean, he just can sing like you've never heard anyone else sing in the whole wide world. And today we are joyful because Miss Jan's gone home to be with the Lord. She's not, she's not somewhere lost. We know exactly where it is. We might not know exactly what mansion she's living in, but she's happy wherever she's at. And I just want to share with you today that uh, I feel like it's so important for me to tell you just a little bit about how we met. So one Sunday, I was here in the church. We were in two services at the time. Of, that's, we call everything around here, we call it pre-pandemic. And what happens is this lady and her mom comes walking in and she's a spunky little thing. She walks in and she said, do you preach the Bible? And I said, Yes, ma'am, front to back, I even believe the maps. And she started laughing, and she said, okay, I believe we're in the right place. Well, me and Jesus talked many, many times, and it's hard to get everybody going. And I said, I don't care what time you come, as long as you come. So she, she kept coming, and so when they would get out of the car, we finally said, we want you just to pull your car up. Our guys will take care of you, Eric. Eric and Shane and all those guys, and then Big Larry was that back there trying to help with her, and you know nobody would. I mean, she was. You seemed fragile, but she was tough. And she came, and she loved church. She loved to be with God's people. She loved to be able to laugh and cut up. And there's one thing that you can know. I can tell you personally is that every day she was praying for the church, and she was praying for people in the church. She was praying for those that were sick on the prayer list. And she kept pushing. She kept moving forward. It's amazing to me how she even got around at the end. But you know what? When you know what you're doing, it's easier. I thought about from that wonderful scripture that we grew up with from Proverbs 31. Says, and I'm reading this from the Passion Translation. It's becoming one of my favorites real quick. It says, who could ever find a wife like this one? She is a woman of strength and mighty vapor. She's full of wealth and wisdom. The price paid for her was greater than many jewels. Her husband has entrusted his heart to her, for she brings him richest spoils of victory. All throughout her life, she brings him in what is good and not evil. She searches out continuously to process that which is pure and righteous. She delights in the work of her hands, and she gives out the revelation of truth to feed others. She is like a trading ship bringing divine supplies from the merchants. It gets better. Even in the night session, she rises and sets food on the table for the hungry ones in her house and for others. She sets her heart upon a field and takes it as her own. She labors there and plants the living vines. She wraps herself in strength and mighty and power and all of her She tastes and experiences a better substance. Her shining light will not extinguish, not even in death, no matter how dark the light gets. She stretches out her hand to help the needy, and she lays hold on the wheels of government. I wish she could help me with that one. She is known by her extravagant generosity to the poor, for she always reaches out her hand to those in need. She is not afraid in tribulation. For all of her household is covered with a pure garment of righteousness and grace. Her clothing is beautiful, knitted together. A purple gown extinguishes her. Her husband is famous and admired by all, sitting as a judge of his people. Even her works of righteousness she does for the benefit of of her enemies. Bold power, glory and mighty are wrapped around her as she laughs for joy over the latter days. Her teachings are filled with wisdom and kindness as loving instructions pour out from her lips. She watches over the way her household meets every need. Her sons and daughters arise and in one accord they exalt her virtues and her husband arise speaking in glowing terms. There are many valiant and noble ones, but no one ascends far above her. Charm can be misleading. Beauty is vain, so quickly fades. But a virtuous woman lives in the wonderful awe and the fear of the Lord. 
she be praised throughout eternity. So go ahead and give her all the credit that is due, and there's much. For she has become a radiant woman, and all her loving works of righteousness deserves to be admired at the gateway of every city. So when you look at her life, she describes it to the T. Now, she would be the first one to tell you she wasn't perfect. She might have thought she was at times, but she wasn't perfect. But she was a wonderful person. to be. With. Our church has is, is lost a great saint in our church. And she, she, the one thing that she always kept telling us, if I'm not there, I'm praying. I love you. That's good stuff. So today we're here to celebrate her life. We're here to lift up Judith and to encourage her. She's done well trying to help her mom and take care of her. So we want to do this. I want to pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Would you join me, please? Father, we come and thanking you for Janice's life. We love when she would come in the door, Lord. She was so worried until one day I just said, please don't worry about being late. It is okay. We need you. It removed all that stress that she would get under, and we were just glad when she was here. God, she has a history that would take days to tell. So, Father, I pray that we could just honor you today, Lord, by giving you honor and glory for saving Jan's life. Lift up her son and daughter. Guide them through the process. Let them know we love them. And, Lord, we can't wait to see her because she'll be at the gate waiting for us. Praise be to the Lord. And all God's people said, amen. I want you to watch this video. It's fabulous. Would you watch this with me, please? Than silver or gold I'd rather be his Than have riches untold I'd rather have Jesus Than houses or land I'd rather be led by his nail scarred hand then to be
I don't think there could have been a better song to set this up, what we're trying to do next. No one knows Jan better than her daughter. And that today I've asked her to come and to share her story. It's a miraculous story. It's, it's not giving up on dream. So, Judith, I want you to come and tell your mom's story. We're going we're gonna to help you. Come on up here. I got this. Yes, ma'am. You talk real loud and they're going to make you sound like Shirley Temple. Oh, okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. There's way more of you than I expected because mom has outlived a good majority of her friends. And um, I'd real quick like to introduce, this is my cousin Scott who came up from near Charleston. Next to him is my friend Holly who came from Alaska. This is our 55th year friend anniversary. Not many people can say that. Her mother was my mother's best friend, so we were just born into it. Beside her is my almost lifelong friend, Cheryl, who her sister couldn't make it today, but because of Holly and Cheryl and one of our other friends that couldn't make it, I'm alive today. And my dear friend, Trina, who is, she's my power of attorney. Does that, do I have to say anything more? So, and they're representing a much broader group of friends that have other obligations today. Um, sorry. You know, have you noticed since the pandemic, you're kind of really self-conscious about licking your fingers? Um, I'm just gonna read kind of a little bit, but I'm gonna sort of work at um, not sounding, mo sounding monotone. Okay. My mother was born to Jared and Charlotte Munson on Friday, June 16, 1933, in Cortland, New York, and lived in Homer and Binghamton until she was 16 years old. She was born in time to celebrate the end of Prohibition. Okay, come on, that was funny. <laughs> okay, and, and I do come from some Jewish stock, so it's okay to laugh. We, they, we laugh at certain things. Okay, at 16, her family, moved to Birmingham, Alabama, and while living there, she attended a revival where she realized how utterly evil she was. Now, let me tell you how evil my mother was. According to today's standards, we would consider her the ultimate goody two-shoes, the worst things that I know that she ever did, really, that I'll tell you was stealing dimes out of her mother's little coin purse to go to the movies, which was, of course, a sin. The stealing and the movies. Um, and then dancing. Oh, my goodness, she danced. Like David didn't. So anyway, they moved to Birmingham. She, she met Jesus because even as good as we think she was, she realized our lost state and she never turned back, and she served the Lord for 72 years faithfully. Um, we're not always perfect, so there's been a few bumps along the way, which some of my closer friends have seen me through. Um, after high school, she moved to Hackettstown, New Jersey, to be with her sister and brother-in-law who were pastoring a church. She met a lady and her daughters who eventually ended up being my grandmother and my aunts. They introduced her to their returning brother and son, who was on leave from, on leave from the army 
from service in Germany. She married him two and a half months later. She moved quick. She married him on Christmas Day, 1952, and boy, did that tick off a few people. Kind of made them mad that they had to ruin their Christmas. But anyway, um, they were married for two months. Now, a lot of you, some of these folks know the history. A few of you do know her history better than others. But a lot of the people know this little 80-something-year-old woman. They have no idea what she has done. And I didn't realize how awesome it was until I started writing some of this down. Um, after she'd been married to my father for two months, he was sent to Africa to a, a station called Kanyu Station in Asmara, Eritrea, which was owned by Ethiopia at the time. It took him 19 and a half months to get the military to send her over there, and they told him, Corporal Fleecer, if Uncle Sam wanted you to have a wife, he would have issued you one. My father was the wrong person to say that to. But anyway, they got her over there, and nine months and three days later, David Lance Fleecer showed up. He is her first son, and he wasn't able to make it today, but he did get to see Mom this year for Mother's Day. So I'm glad that he got to see her before rather than after. Eventually, my father was stationed at White Sands, New Mexico, where my mother had their second son, my brother, Stephen Thomas Fleecer. Several years later, while stationed at Fort Wainwright, Alaska, my mother gave birth to me, Judith Rachel Fleecer. I'm the one that was in the picture with the cool little Eskimo booties on. In 1966, my family left Alaska and moved to Fort Huachuca, Arizona, where my father was deployed to Vietnam, and my mother ran the household and took care of us and kept our family together until his return in late 1967. By 1968, the arm, he had processed out of the Army, and we started our trek back to Alaska. We lived in North Pole, Alaska, which really actually does have, that's where Santa Claus's house is, I, I promise. But um, we were living on a compound, which some people might kind of call a commune, and it was a radio station, and the call letters were KJ and P, and that, they said that standard for King Jesus North Pole. The big cool thing was at the time, most people didn't have 50,000 watt radio stations, and we had one. And he was the newscaster, and his voice went as far as Siberia. Um, about a year later, in 69, we moved back to Delta Junction, Alaska, where we remained for several years. I graduated from high school there, as did my two older brothers. My father and mother owned the local newspaper, and he was the editor of the Delta Midnight Sun. Uh, many of you probably hear that the sun stays up all the time in Alaska. During the summertime in my hometown, it pretty well does. And so it was an aptly named paper. He was really proud of that. I think that was a huge accomplishment for him. At the same time, um, well, before that, my father had become an ordained minister. And it may seem like I'm speaking about my father a lot, but behind a really good father is a really good mother most of the time. And she was his helpmeet. Um, she was a keeper at home, and she began a part-time job uh, working at a laundromat, you know, real kind of hard labor. But she wasn't allowed to do that until I went to school. So my father would pick me up from kindergarten and then go pick her up so that I was never coming home to an empty home. And the older I get, the more I see these kids growing up without parents in the home. I am so appreciative. We didn't know that we were poor. And <laughs> we just knew that our parents loved us. And I, I think that's pretty important. We lived in that little shack that you saw that was a little tiny travel trailer with only a double bed in it, but a little kitchen and those two rooms added on. We had no running water, and we were heated by wood, a wood stove. Holly reminded me that I need to mention that 
temperatures in a good portion of the year get down to 60 below zero. So that was a lot of work to keep that home warm. So no matter how tough things were, because I, like I said, we were, I realize now we were what would be considered very poor. We always had enough. And my dad frequently would bring GIs home from church. After, after Sunday service, we lived right next door to the church. And we were always given to hospitality. We always had people in for food. And we always had enough. Nobody went without and nobody went hungry. My parents raised us in a very godly home, which may seem to some people incredibly strict, but you know, fences are a good thing. They did a Bible study or a little devotional with us every morning, and every night before bedtime, we had Bible stories. We grew up knowing the word, and we had a foundation. And the Bible does say to bring up a child in the way he shall go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. And I'm ha happy to say that my brother and I are both serving the Lord. Um, my dad had taken a job driving a school bus, and in March of 1972, he had to go for a physical in order to keep his bus driving certificate. The outcome was a little bit devastating and very unexpected. He was told that he had a form of cancer that was very rare called lymphosarcoma. God in his mercy took him home within seven and a half months. In that time, I watched my mother take, you know, they got married really young and she took the most loving care of him until it was beyond her realm of capability to do that. She kept the faith, she kept the home, and she kept our family together through a really scary, horrible time. And because we were so isolated in Alaska, the Army sent him out to uh, the Seattle area to a hospital. And we just kind of thought he was going to end up dying alone with no family there. And <laughs> I'm not going to cry. I'm not crying. If I do cry, it's not because my mom is gone. It's because I'm touched by the love of friends. Holly's father called my mom and said, pack your bags. I'm coming to get you. You're going to fly out to Seattle and be with your husband. And she said, well, I, I can't afford the ticket. And he said, I didn't ask you to pay for it. It's provided. That's a friend. That a friend in need, you know, you hear a friend in need, it was a friend in deed. He was indeed our friend and still is at 92 and a half. Yes, we're still blessed to have both of her parents who are kind of my second parents. So my mom was able to be with my father when he passed and she kept putting one foot in front of the other after he passed away and whenever she'd get a little scared, scriptures would come to mind and she just kept pressing on. That's kind of what I'm doing now. She taught us to live one day at a time and to trust completely in the Lord. By Christmas of 73, so a little over a year later, I was really missing having a father in the home. So I know what it's like to not have a father. You know, and I look at these people who have these kids with that are single parents, and I, my heart breaks for the kids, and I pray for them because I know what it's like to be without a daddy. I went to sit on, we had, um, sorry, let me back up. We went um, to the, the gym, and we were having a Santa come in so that we could sit and tell him our, our wishes, and I was like, well, he's not the real Santa. So I don't really want to sit on his lap, but I kind of had to go along so that I didn't ruin it for everybody else. So this Santa and Mrs. Claus that you saw in the picture, you might wonder where, where those people came from, but I sat on his lap and he goes, oh, little girl, what do you want for Christmas? 
and I was really in a bad mood. <laughs> and I remember looking at him and saying, I want a new daddy. And I said it with as much venom as I could muster at 10 years old, or actually nine. Um, of course, that kind of shocked Santa. 16 months later, my mom married that Santa. So um, the lady that was sitting on Santa's lap as Mrs. Claus, two months after that picture was taken, they married. I mean, things happen kind of, you know, complicated, and we do, we do things extraordinarily in Alaska. They were married in February of 74, and she passed away in January of 75. Ten days after her death, she and my dad met at church at a Bible study, my stepdad. Um, I only say that to differentiate between the two. Um, three months to the day later, they were married. Boy, did some people in town talk about that. Um, and they kind of were mad because I think some of the women thought that, well, we wanted a chance at him, but we got him. So anyway, God blessed me with a phenomenal stepfather that most people never knew wasn't my father because he was, I couldn't call him daddy, he wasn't my daddy, but he was a daddy to me. He was precious. My mom and dad were both ordained and went into the ministry after he retired. And in 1995, they went to Russia with the navigators and stayed there as missionaries for a year. And they went back. The, a lot of people in the mission field, the, the people that you minister to, they say, yeah, it's nice that you came here. And they think we're on kind of a vacation. And you're not, and they would tell them, we know we'll never see you again, that you're just kind of doing your duty and coming here. They actually returned for two months. And they funded that themselves. And it made an impact that there were a few churches that were started because of what the navigators did. And there are a lot of Christian churches in Russia, not just because of my mom and dad, but because of the group that they went with. And I'm still in touch with some of the Russian ladies that they met while they were there. In 2002, my stepdad suffered a severe spinal cord injury, breaking his back and be, becoming paralyzed from the waist down. Most of you probably know about the prayer of Jabez. We, we had, that morning, we prayed the prayer of Jabez, that God would expand our borders, he would bless us. And within 10 minutes, here's my dad laying on the ground, I wasn't sure if he was gonna die or not. And turns out, that about a year after he recovered from the injury, while he had been in the hospital, the doctor asked him if he would minister to someone in the bed next to him. And that started a trend. They started volunteering up at the hospital and they did it for nine years. My dad would minister to people who had the spinal cord injuries. My mom would minister to the caregivers. And they did that up until they just couldn't go anymore. And I really value that what they did because volunteering in those kind of situations is very, very hard. I watched my mother care for my dad in the most loving, kind way that I've ever witnessed in my life. I mean, taking care of a paraplegic is a lot more than most people would ever dream of, and I don't wish it on anyone. I learned how to, to be selfless from watching her and realized that the love between them actually intensified after the accident because it would have been really easy for us to flick him away and put him in a nursing home, but we couldn't. This man had provided the most loving family for us. So a lot of the pictures that you have seen of her are with him because quite frankly, in the 39 years that they were together, they were only separated for seven nights in all of those years. Where you found one, you found the other. Um, a few things that I learned from my mother are that are very important to me 
is in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, to in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know, you hear your mother over and over and over again, and you think it's nagging, but then you hit a point in your adult life where you're stumbling and having some trouble, and you hear those words. Her words will always be with me. I will never forget, hopefully, till the end, the things that she taught me. And it gives me an opportunity to talk to young people, and the ones that are willing will listen to some wisdom that they a lot of times aren't getting from their surroundings and the people that they're working with and living around. I learned also that we are never helpless, that God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. I heard when we were in struggles, I would hear that woman praying these promises over and over again. She taught me to be kind. In Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, loving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That had to be drilled into my head. Because it's not always easy to be kind to people, especially certain ones. Right, Holly? <laughs> anyway, that's a little in our joke. We, we've known somebody actually longer. She's known the other person longer than we have. And it's, we love her, but we've had struggles. So anyway, we were taught to be given to hospitality just by their example. It wasn't preached at us. Our dad just always brought people in and we fed them <laughs> when we really kind of didn't know where the next meal was coming from. We were taught to love the unlovely. And my mom would always say, when I'd say, I don't want to play with her anymore, she's a brat. My mom would say, well, what reward have you if you only love the lovely? And I hear that over and over and over again when I get to the point where I don't want anything to do with the world. Because we're supposed to be the salt. We're not supposed to stay in our little shaker. <laughs> so um, what, I'm just going to read a couple scriptures that I sort of actually have memorized, but I don't want to embarrass myself. In Psalm 37, 1 through 7, okay, I'm almost there. I should have had these marked. I'm sorry. 37, 1 through 7. She taught me this because there were people that would get away with things. And, you know, when you're taught right from wrong and you see children in your class getting their way with things, you come home. How do you answer to a child, well, mommy, he did this and nobody did anything. So she taught me, fret not thyself of evildoers, neither be envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Thou shalt dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. A little add-on to that is she would always say, I wondered at the prosperity of the wicked until I entered the house of the Lord and I saw their end. So I was like, oh, okay. I, I guess God can handle this and I don't have to. Took a lot of pressure off. Learning not to be judgmental was one of the things that she taught me. <laughs> it's still hard sometimes. In James 5.16, part of that verse says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I was taught with King James. So I looked up the word fervent, which most of us would understand. But I looked it up in, in the dictionary, and it said some of the synonyms were hot-blooded, impassioned, infused, and red-hot. And that's how that woman prayed. And even though we would maybe move or people would move away from us and get transferred in jobs, 
her, her envelope of who she prayed for got thicker and thicker and thicker. And in Romans 8, 28, she would always tell me, okay, somebody help me. How does it start? Oh, for we know that all things work together for good to them who are called according to the Lord and work his purpose. And when she met my stepdad at um, church, right after his, his wife had just died, because she knew what it was like to be without a spouse and just have them ripped away from you, she, she didn't want to be like, ooh, I, I've got to go marry him. But she wanted to give him a, a word of encouragement. And this has been part of the theme of our family for the last, well, over 40 years now that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. My mother has quoted that scripture up until just about the day that she died because like Barry said, she had a stamina. She was, in some ways she was stubborn in a good way, but in a lot of ways, she showed me how to keep pressing on. And she was trying to keep walking so that she wouldn't lose the ability to walk. And she said, I will run and not be weary. I will walk and not faint. So that are, those are some last words that I remember. And then I don't actually have this one memorized as well as I would like to. So um, got Lamentations 3, 22 and 26. And can somebody please tell me where um, Lamentations is? I, Gil? <laughs> Barry? It's in the middle of the Bible. Well, it's in the middle of the Bible, turn left. I'm sorry, like I said, I, I knew I was going to forget something. So I should have actually put uh, little spacers in my book, in my Bible here, and I didn't. But basically, um, okay, I'm, t I'm at Malachi, so I know I'm too far. Anyway, um, in, Lament in Lamentations 22, it says that it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, that his compassions fail not. And there used to be a, a song back during the Jesus days, back in the 70s, that it would say, he is, his compassions fail not. They are new like the dew every morning that we live. Father, great is your faithfulness. This woman was faithful in the little and in the much. And she was rewarded. And ultimately, she has gone to her reward. And that's what she wanted. She was a daughter, a wife, a mother, a pastor's wife, a bus driver. I my dad taught her how to drive a big old school bus before he passed away. She was a worship leader. She was an ordained minister. And she taught women how to be keepers at home, which is kind of a becoming a lost art. Um, she is preceded in death by her first husband, my father, Sidney Fleeser Jr., and her father, Jared Lewis Munson. Her second son, Stephen Fleeser, her brother, Jared Arden Munson, her sister, Norma Brewer, and her mother, Charlotte Smith Munson, and ultimately her second husband, my stepfather, Claire Denning, excuse me, Claire Moss Denning, the Moss is one third of his whole name. She is survived by her oldest son, David Lance, and his wife, Debbie Fleeser. My stepbrother, Sean Moss Denning, and his wife, Susan. Their four children and seven great-grandchildren. And Ike and Tina and Fluffy. Or our cats. I think, I think one of the hardest things that I've witnessed about this is she had me very well prepared for her parting. And I don't think she had the cat prepared because the cat has been in mourning. And it, I pray for Tina. She's really missing my mom. 
In closing, I view the last 20 years of my life caring for my mom and my dad like a saturated cloth that we have wrung dry of every little drop and I have absolutely no regrets. She lived a life well lived serving her master and savior for 72 years. Thank you for coming. Oh, wait a minute. Don't clap yet. Don't. I want to read a cute little letter because Holly's mom wrote this letter to me. Just I was just given this a couple days ago. She calls me Judy, and you're not allowed to. She says, Dear Judy, I'm so glad that Jan and I have been the best of friends. We And she was my mom's best friend. We have shared each other's joys and sorrows, too. I have good memories of picking berries. Us, the girls, us girls, and our, our moms would go out, and us girls would be fighting. We know when to go pick berries. And then by the time we'd get out there, they would be yelling at us, come on, let's go, because we were you know, having fun picking berries. And <clears throat> by the way, someone always had to keep watch for bears. And then going home and baking a berry pie, a blueberry pie. I think we even licked our plates. Holly and I caught them licking their plates when they didn't think anybody was looking. When, when the berries are as precious as they are up there, you know, you children, you are not supposed to lick your plates, okay? <laughs> okay. We'll continue to be friends in heaven. If we eat in heaven, I'll bake your mom a berry pie. You can even lick the plate if you want. Friends forever, much love, Maddie. Now that is one of the things that my mom loved was the luster of life. She would find joy in the most simple things, like licking a berry pie plate. Of course, with nobody looking, except <clears throat> Jesus and Madeline. So in closing, she's with the Lord. She's with a host of witnesses that have gone before her. And I was blessed to hold her hand. I knew she was going. And I had looked over my shoulder and I saw her feet moving. And she'd been pretty non-responsive for several days. And I grabbed her hand and I said, Mother, if Jesus is reaching out his hand for you, you take it. He will help you cross that Jordan and he will pull you up on the other side where your mom and dad will be, your grandparents, your brother and your sister. And I started naming off friends. And when I named off, when I finished with my dad's best friend that had been here and just passed away three years ago, she took her last breath. She was peaceful. And she was with the Lord that fast. So thank you all for coming and honoring my mother. Even though I know a lot of you didn't know her really well, I appreciate the support that you've come out to show me. We're we, we give people applause for stuff like that. While Judith is sitting down, I want you to listen to one of Jan's favorite songs. Sometimes hallelujah Sometimes praise the Lord Sometimes gently sing it Our hearts in one accord. Let's all sing it. Sometimes hallelujah. Sometimes praise the Lord. Sometimes gently sing it. Our hearts in one accord. Oh, let 
let us lift our voices look toward the sky and start to sing let us now return his love just let our voices ring Oh, let us feel his presence. Let the sound of praises fill the air. Let us sing the song of Jesus' love to people Sometimes, oh, hallelujah. Sometimes, praise the Lord. Sometimes, gently singing our hearts in one. unconfined let us sing with freedom unrestrained let's take this feeling that we're feeling now take it outside these walls and let it rain oh Holy Spirit overflow As we are filled from head to toe, we love you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and we want this world to know. Sometimes, oh. Sometimes all Sometimes praise the Lord Sometimes Jesus Our hearts in one Our hearts in one That's some good music. She loved music. If you knew anything about her, she was at the Gaither, always going to be watching Bill Gaither's show, and she didn't care if she'd seen it 20 times before she wanted to watch it again. Let me just share with you real quick that what makes her so unique is this. She knew her purpose for life. She knew for 72 years Everything that she done was to point people to Jesus. I love what it says in, in this. It says, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain in nothing, Job says. My life drags by day after day. I'm giving up. I'm tired of living. Leave me alone. That was never a verse that she would have read. I give you that verse because of the fact she's totally opposite. It didn't matter what was going on. It didn't matter what the situation was. She was always going to push forward because she knew her purpose, even in the moments of death. 
I, I, I've learned that when you know your purpose, it simplifies your life. She lived as simple as you could. No running water. Didn't matter where she was at, whether she was in this part or that. She was what Paul had said, let us be content wherever we are. And for what she did was, she began to realize that it simplified life. See, I, I hate to tell you, but it ain't about you. It's about others. And she lived that. She was focused on her life. She knew what the focus needed to be. Her family, her children, her husbands, her friends. And that was her focus. And I, I love the fact that she loved to sing because she led worship in churches. And, it was, and I think for us, she had this idea of what Paul writes in Philippians. I am focusing all my energies on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Can you just imagine what she saw when she got to heaven's gates? Amazing. Her whole thing, it motivated her life to trust God and to serve God. I don't know about you, but that's called a faithful servant. We need to be like that. We need to be people who are faithful in whatever God gives us and calls us to do. So today, when you think about Jan, just think about faithfulness. I want to do a song that we have that we want to show you and sing. Not me, but just listen to the words, Heaven's Joy Awaits. We'll be having practice in just in a few minutes with that song. I, I want to say this. Now you see she has a variety of music, but it was always pointing to Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we come in closing today. Our lives are better than we can have ever imagined. Lord, it is people like Jan who have paved the way for us to know that your word tells us that 
She is in heaven. He's wiped away all the tears from her eyes. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more mourning. There'll be no more crying. And there will not be any more pain. Thank you for her life. Lord, I think that she would want me to quote this motto. Do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Thank you for her life. We lift up her family. We are better people today because of Jan. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I wanted to invite you to do something uh, Youth is going to be down kind of at the front. If you didn't get to speak to her, come, come by and speak to her for a second. Would you do that? Let's all stand and come do this together. Come gather.